Okay, so as you finish World War II, this is going to be our last lecture for this section. Um, we're going to just really look at the effects of um, how World War II was so devastating to Europe. Uh, World War II was known to require uh, higher levels of mobilization. Um, we talked about like, like total war and mobilization of all troops, um, peoples, resources for the war effort, and um, a lot of sacrifice was um, given into World War II and uh, to a greater scale than World War I. Okay, so if we kind of remember back in the total war um, discussion and activity in class, we talked about how governments are um, centralizing the economy, right? The production and um, the control has come through um, the, the government is dictating um, all of the production for, um, for war. Uh, this is kind of the same pattern, okay? It's a continuation of what happened in World War One and just amplified, okay? All right, so um, we're not here to look at the specific battles and who won this battle, okay? Uh, we're just looking at just some main turning points, all right? So um, the first one um, is going to be in Egypt. I'm probably going to butcher this. El Alamein. This is um, in uh, North Egypt. And uh, this is where British forces uh, drove the Germans um, out of Egypt, okay? And so then you can kind of see with the arrows, um, the allies, the British and the U.S., begin to push through North Africa. And then you have more U.S. troops and British troops landing in Morocco and Algeria. And so slowly, uh, the Nazis are getting pushed out of Northern Africa, Um and they're going through uh, the Mediterranean and going up the Italian peninsula. Okay, so this is kind of like the initial um, Allied powers response of how to counterattack. So th at this point, it's 1942. Just as a reminder, in the last lecture, we talked about how in the course of war with Blitzkrieg, right, and Hitler's, um, you know, um, strategy of basically... Um, expanding and attacking as quickly as possible, he has conquered much of the land um, by 1941, even right before even Pearl Harbor was bombed and the United States has joined World War II officially. So if you can look at this, this map, the light purple uh, is exemplifying how much territory is under Axis control, uh, mainly the Nazis. Um, Italy is not as successful in, in, in its its battles, but it has some um, land acquisitions. Um, but for the most part, Nazis are, are in control. So they're looking to defend now, because in 1942, everything is kind of starting to change. So North Africa campaign around 1942, and then we can um, direct our attention over um, into um, Russia. Okay, if you look at Soviet Union, uh, we have Stalingrad in 1942. Um, this is the critical battle on the Eastern Front. Okay, so this is where um, the first official, like real defeat of the um, German army on land. And so Hitler wanted to target Stalingrad because it was an industrial city. Um, and there are a lot of like Soviet oil fields in the area. Um, and so the Soviets outnumbered the, the Germans at the point and Hitler did not want his men to surrender, so he eventually lost 300,000 men in the Battle of Stalingrad, which which was a major victory for the Soviet Union, and they're able to push back, as you can see, um, on the right-hand side with those red arrows, okay? Um, that's all I really need to go into details for as far as, like, how much and what happened in each battle, but these are just kind of the iconic ones, right? Uh, the main one that you do need to know is, of course, D-Day. You probably learned this from world history already. So this is June 6, 1944. So if we know that the war ends in 45, this is like, you know, in the final years of where everything is being tipped, right? The scale is being tipped over at this point. This is also called Operation Overlord. Okay, so this is going to take place um, in France, on the beaches of France, across the English Channel. Okay, and so we're looking at 100... 20,000 troops crossing English Channel, but even like another like 50,000 troops being dropped behind enemy lines, paratroopers. Um, and so it's like a full on invasion. They call it an amphibious invasion because it's land and sea. Um, and <clears throat> this is an important invasion uh, of France because at this point, as you can see, France has been conquered by the Nazis and 
Um, the Germans are basically defending the coastal area, hoping that the British and the Allied troops are not going to um, come and invade um, along the coastal areas that they have taken over. Okay, so uh, at this point, uh, we do know that D-Day is successful. Okay, at high casualty rates, um, you know, with many losses, the Allies were able to take back Normandy, the beach. Right, and eventually, in a month later, they're going to push into France and reclaim Paris, which is a good thing because that's the capital. And at this point, we have a Western Front, right? So the Eastern Front has been kind of established with Stalingrad. Now, Western Front is now reestablished once again. And we're going to eventually see uh, from the Red Arrows that the Allied troops will push towards um, Germany in its original um, country's borders. And Hitler is now looking at, hey, I have like three fronts, right? I have the Western Front, I have the Eastern Front, and I also have the front that uh, we have to face with the Allied troops down in Italy in the Mediterranean, okay? Um, eventually, um, Hitler will commit suicide um, once he sees that the Allied troops uh, have closed in enough. And then on May 8th, 1945, this is what we call VE Day. So on the opening slide, they call it VE because it's Victory in Europe Day. And so May 8th, 1945 is when Germany will officially surrender. Once, you know, your top head, chop off the head, right? Once the head is gone, pretty much you have taken him down, okay? Um, taking down the leadership. All right, um, then the only major uh, Axis power that is left is Japan. Um, Italy is going to surrender like in 1944 when the Allies liberate Rome and Mussolini will be captured by his own people. We'll go into that in a little bit, but um, Italy was never um, like a huge um, threat to the Allies. It's really mainly the Nazis, okay? Um, all right, so Japan is going to surrender in August of 1945 because uh, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and eventually in September they just officially surrendered. Um, the conditions of how they'd surrender was kind of like up to discussion and debatable at that time, but that's kind of like how it all kind of transpired was um, through the, the drug and atomic bomb, okay? All right, so um, I just had these animations earlier, but if you look at down in uh, North Africa by Egypt, this is El Amin, um, and then you have uh, the Moroccan and Algerian invasion of the Allied troops, and then they're pushing towards this way, um, the Italian peninsula, this is what we call the soft underbelly, okay, this is probably the um, least um, defended, easiest way to access an invasion through this way. Okay, and then we have the Battle of Stalingrad right over in this area, and then of course the D-Day Operation Overlord invasion is happening in Normandy right there, okay? All right, I think that's it. Oh yeah, and then Berlin is ult ultimately uh, uh, liberated in 1945, May 8th, okay? All right, so diplomacy, really important. This was one way of how um, the Allied powers were able to work together, um, more or less, more or less, okay, in order to strategically plan for their victory and to take down the Nazis, okay? Um, it's very clear at the point where the Nazis had control in 1941 that they, they had to be stopped. If they weren't stopped and... They just continue to allow these countries to be taken over, you know, left and right. Um, Hitler would want to take over the entire world, okay? And there's nothing to stop him unless that they would get together, right? So the first conference we're going to talk about, there's several conferences. The first one happens in 1943. It's called Casablanca, okay? Um, Casablanca, um, city in North Africa. Um, we have FDR and Churchill meeting together first, right? And they decide that... Uh, with the Axis powers and all other enemies, they demand an unconditional surrender. So they're going to plan for an attack. At this point, the United States is in because they've already been bombed by Pearl Harbor. Um, sorry, by Japan for Pearl Harbor. And um, they agree that when they are going to win this war, right, um, they expect an unconditional surrender. So this is really important as a theme. Unconditional surrender means that um, the enemy has to surrender and not negotiate. Like, oh, like... You kind of remember with the um, World War One and with Russia, and they surrendered to Germany, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, right? That was a conditional surrender because Russia surrendered on the conditions of if we give you this land, you leave us alone. FDR Churchill saying unconditional surrender, no negotiations, 
once you surrender, we call the shots, we were in charge, okay? This is where they also decide that Italy is going to be the first place of invasion. And at this point, Stalin's going to remember that, oh, hey, you chose to um, go through Italy, and you're not trying to set up a Western Front and invade France, and you're going to wait until 1944, which is so much longer, where the Russians have to basically fight the German army on the Eastern Front by themselves for a couple of years, okay? All right, the next conference is going to be the Tehran Conference. This one is where the big three, you have Stalin, uh, Churchill, and FDR meeting together, as you can see on the right-hand side. Um, this is take place in Iran, a very neutral area. Um, so the Allies agreed that, uh, hey, this is where we're going to set up D-Day. This is where we're going to have our major inversion in Western Europe. We're going to take back France. Okay. Um, Stalin says that um, we will push along the east. And the countries that we liberate in Eastern Europe, at this point, Stalin says that, hey, you know what? Um, I believe that the Soviets will free these countries from uh, Nazi control, right? Um, Stalin believes that the Soviets should control Eastern Europe. Um, Churchill opposes Stalin, and this is where kind of like the whole Cold War finds its roots, okay? And it's where Churchill says that, no, Eastern Europe should have free elections. They should have their own governments. They should have self-determination, okay? Um, this is important because there should be a balance of power. It shouldn't be just, a, you know, your empire dominating, okay? FDR is kind of in the middle. It's kind of like being the mediator between the two. Um, and we're going to see what's going to happen after that, okay? Then we get to um, the Alta Conference in 1945. This is um, before Germany is about to surrender, okay? Um, this is, most importantly, where uh, the United Nations is formed um, as a peacekeeping organization. And uh, this is where the big three, right, the U.S., Great Britain, and Russia will be um, sitting on what they call the Security Council, including China and France. Okay, these are the five permanent members, and they are making most of the major decisions. Um, and then you have like other members that are part of the Security Council that would rotate in. There are other countries. Okay, uh, notice how the the losers of World War II are not part of the permanent Security Council because they're not trusted at this time. Um, one thing that is also degree, uh, agreed upon is what will happen to Germany at, when, at the point they will surrender, right? So they realize, hey, um, Allied victory is about to happen, VE Day is about to come. Uh, Germany, should we trust them to have their own government again? If we set up another peace treaty, will it be a repeating of Treaty of Versailles? Will it be another bitterness and resentment? Well, how can we prevent that, right? So what they agreed upon was that uh, we're going to divide up Germany into four zones, four sectors that will be controlled by each major allied power. France, British, um, Great Britain, United States, and the Soviet Union will each control kind of like a one quarter of Germany at that point, okay? Um, all right, that was decided. And then our last conference is after Germany surrenders, before Japan surrenders in July 1945, this is the Potsdam Conference. So Potsdam is the city right outside Berlin, and obviously they can meet inside um, Germany now because the Germans have given up. Okay, so at this part, at this point in the war, it's almost over. It's 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 done in Europe, but in in the Asian theater, right in the Pacific, it's still the fighting still going on. Um, FDR has passed away, and now Truman is in power. Uh, Harry Truman is the next president after uh, FDR. And this is where they decide that, hey, if Japan is going to surrender, they will surrender unconditionally. The problem is that Japan does not want to surrender because the emperor is seen as God, and God would be seen as human if he gives up and he loses. So what the Americans and the British and the Soviets all agree that, okay, well, um, we'll just say that the army, the military of Japan will surrender unconditionally not the emperor. That way he can save face and that kind of stuff and he can still stay in power, okay? Um, during that time, Japan was given a warning, but it was very vague. It was that Japan should um, agree to terms of unconditional surrender or else face utter destruction. Now, this is really like kind of vague. It never said anything about, we will have an atomic bomb that will we'll drop on you, right? That was not specifically explained, right? Um, at this point, um, Stalin is going to take back what he said about having Eastern Europe um, 
possibly having some free elections. Um, that's what, sorry, that's what Solon said in the Yalta conference. Okay, so now Solon's going back, flip-flopping a little bit, but it's very clear, okay, that Stalin, as you can see in the lower left-hand map, um, Stalin wants to have um, a Soviet influence in Eastern Europe. He believes that communism should uh, be the controlling power and system of governments in that area, okay? And the fact is that he will leave all of his military troops that he has brought throughout Eastern Europe to push towards Germany, um, and he's just going to leave it there so that he can occupy those areas. He, now he's created what we call a buffer zone. So as you can see, uh, that red territory is all Soviet-dominated, okay? Um, all right, so um, at this point in the Potsdam Conference, this is kind of like the concluding European conference. They're, they're deciding the end of war decisions with Japan. They decided, hey, we're going to drop the atomic bomb, and Truman says we're going to go for it. Um, and they also decide upon, like, what, how will they denazify Germany, right? How will they demilitarize Germany? Because obviously they need to be taken care of, and now it's in their hands what to do, okay? All right, so um, why did Germany lose? Okay, several reasons. I'm going to just go through them really quickly. One, they had to fight the three-front war. Okay, as a reminder, they had to basically um, kind of spread their army thin across the entire continent, right? Along the western front, eastern front, and also the, the southern side. Um, you know, Germany's army wasn't like unlimited, right? So we know that um, the Soviet army was much more in number, and so in order to, you know, and have a, like a realistic fight, you had to have the right amount of troops in all places, right? And so if you think about what Germany has to do to kind of like offset what Italy is not able to do, and they're basically definitely being flanked on all sides from all the fronts, okay? Um, some of the major mistakes and defeats that Germany made was that, uh, for one, there was the Battle of Britain. I didn't really go over this in detail, but the Battle of Britain was basically an air battle where um, Hitler hoped that his Luftwaffe could defeat the Royal Air Force of Great Britain, um, but they were unable to invade Britain successfully. And so at this point, um, Britain was able to defend itself well, remain intact, and then facilitate that invasion of Normandy. Okay, um, So that was the Battle of Britain, which I have right here. Then we have the Battle of Stalingrad. Because Hitler lost this battle, this was a major turning point where the Soviets could then push the Nazis back out of their own uh, Soviet territory. Okay. Um, and then also, um, we talked about how Hitler had to basically pick up the slack for Italy and um, cover Italy from getting conquered, which they eventually will be. But uh, Germany had to kind of step in and send troops down there. Also had to send troops down into the Balkans because Italy could not take Yugoslavia successfully, could not take Albania and Greece successfully. And so this is where uh, the Nazis had to really like kind of spread themselves out throughout the continents. Um, and the last thing is that um, Hitler automatically agreed that when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, that they're now at war with the U.S. By, by quickly doing so, and realistically did so because he's in an alliance with Japan, um, this guarantee that U.S. and Britain is now going to attack Germany, where the U.S. could have just focused on just the Pacific side. But because, you know, uh, Hitler agreed to declare war on the United States, now it's another enemy strong powerful enemy added to them okay um, other reasons um, <clears throat> Germany's industrial capacity was not equal to the Allied powers well for one yeah they were very much thriving and rebuilding however they're still just one country right the United States alone okay we kind of like um, overlook the scale and grandness our country is but the, the US alone outproduced all of the Axis powers combined uh, when it began to start up its war machine um, in the 1940s, okay? And so um, by the Allied troops bombing German cities and German factories, this also hindered uh, the industrial production of Germany. Germany also had to reply, uh, rely upon, upon uh, slave labor. So if you guys remember the labor camps, uh, during the Holocaust, and so not just the Jews, but other ethnic minorities would have to work for them. But you know they're not as ef as efficient workers because the way they're being treated, and they're mainly doing just like manual labor, not really as doing as much factory stuff. Um, 
and much of the resources were used to spent uh, were used spent for the final solution carrying out the Holocaust, and so. Germany had kind of like many different mouths to feed, so to say, uh, during this end part of the war, okay? And it's not until 1943, towards the end part of the war, right, during the turning point is when Germany shifted its economy to then focus on total war. So before this, remember, they were definitely, you know, pushing for war, but total war is to another scale. It means that complete mobilization of all peoples and all resources, okay? Um, because of the Nazi ideals and the values, of having a traditional family, women were not promoted or even recommended to be part of the workforce and doing manual heavy labor, which much of um, the other Allied powers, you know, allowed um, for women to participate um, in this time while the men are often fighting. Right? Okay. Um, all right. So the Axis powers, like I said, they were pretty much liabilities to the Nazis, where. Um, Italy couldn't really pull its own weight, and the Germany had to get into the Balkans themselves to cover them. And Germany eventually sends its forces into Italy just to do a final wave of protection against the Allies, and eventually loses. Um, and the Grand Alliance proves that uh, they, the Allied powers, okay, and forty other countries, um, were able to work together to team up, and rightly so, in the sense where. You know, they recognized the huge threat that Hitler was and how powerful the Nazi Empire became. And so um, this alliance, called the Grand Alliance, um, was able to be on the same page and orchestrate strategically of how to take down Germany and put them into a position of unconditional surrender. Okay, So probably the most important part of this lecture is the effects and results. Um, I've given you guys a chart before in the World War One one, and so this is just adding to it for us to understand the scale of the casualties. Okay, so as far as human losses, about 55 million people are dead. Now, this is an estimation; it's really hard to calculate exactly and precisely. But this includes missing people. Um, most of them um, are going to be civilians, as you can kind of see in the casualties, um, and that's you know to a greater degree than what World War One had. Okay. The, uh, the Soviet Union, obviously, we always know that in World War One and World War Two, they get smashed and they take the most hits. Um, the Soviet Union pretty much sent everything that they could uh, because this is what they called the Great Patriotic War. And for them, if they did not win and they were taken over by the Nazis, like France was, you know, that would pretty much be the end because um, when Hitler had in mind Lebensraum, right? He had in mind that the Slavs, which are the Russian people, they will be the slaves. All of them will be the slaves of the Aryan race, and so you know they had basically their their not just their lives on the line, but their whole history, right? Their whole heritage, their whole future on the line uh, for that. Okay, uh, for the Holocaust, uh, we know six million Jews die, but also with the other people that are targeted in the Holocaust, such as the homosexuals, such as um, the handicapped people, um, such as um, Africans. Okay. Um, other Slavs, six million others. So you have 12 million people alone from the Holocaust being killed. Most of them are innocent civilians. Okay, um, displaced persons, people that are homeless, people that have to relocate because of all the destruction. Right, they are refugees. They are leaving their countries. Um, we have 30 to 50 million people no longer can live in their own home. They are displaced into another country, into another city. They have no home at all, and this is crazy. Okay. Um, Germans themselves, like civilians, they have to live outside of Germany because it's no longer safe because of all the destruction and fighting and everything. Devastation was there, okay. And so, uh, the you know throughout um, the European continent, we're seeing that there is so much destruction. There's ruins everywhere. It's going to take years, if not a decade or so, to rebuild its infrastructure. To rebuild its economy, cities like Warsaw are in complete devastation, and Poland, man, Poland's just a wrecking ground as Poland has always been. Okay, um, so consider this, right? At the end of World War One, right? There's all the disillusionment and people's like uh, perspectives on life were warped completely, right? Um, so after World War Two, if the casualties were of a greater scale and destruction was a greater scale, and technology and all that kind of stuff was added into this. Uh, we can understand that the societal values was even more um, devastated, diminished, destroyed. Okay, um, 
to a greater degree than how Asian anxiety after World War One is. Okay, because it's like, oh man, it happened again, and then it's even these I mean, more depressing atrocities. It's unimaginable. Okay, um, for one thing, women played a larger role in World War Two um, in terms of supporting the war economy. Then the war, World War One. They also gained more rights after World War Two, more respect because of their contributions for that. Okay, so everything pretty much in World War Two, I would say, is just a greater degree than World War One. Um, but you know, at the end of World War One, they had no idea what would happen with World War Two. Okay, that's why you know the 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 fear of World War Three is like, is it going to be double World War Two? Is it going to be triple World War Two? Ten times? Like we don't even know. We don't want to even imagine that. Okay, so. Um, the end and taking out, taking away from this is that uh, the United States and the Soviet Union are going to be recognized as the two main we call superpowers, the dominant, influential, powerful states, um, and they are going to compete for influence in the world. Whether it's going to be for their type of um, ideology of communism or capitalism or democracy, and it's going to lead us into the Cold War. So, uh, in conclusion, World War II was the single largest event uh, for Europe and. I would say for the world, where um, civilization really was at each other's throats, and it was, you know, considering all the losses, it was very catastrophic.